So before we uh, begin and uh, uh, with our presentation for this first part of the afternoon, and I introduce John, we're going to have a few minutes of meditation practice, again, guided by Richie Davidson. Richie. Thank you, Al, and uh, thank you all. Uh, this has really been such a rich uh, and important gathering. Uh, let's take a few moments to bring awareness to this moment. Let's sit in an upright posture. Again, not too tight, not too loose, with our eyes either open or gently close, whichever feels most comfortable. And as we do in every period of practice, Let's begin by reminding ourselves why we're here. And let's see if we can find this place within ourselves where we recognize that a calmer mind and an open heart is beneficial not only for ourselves, but for all the other beings that we touch directly or indirectly, and for Mother Earth, that we have the precious opportunity to visit for the short period of our lives. Let's sit with that motivation for a few moments and let it seep into all the pores of our mind and body. Maybe take one or two deep breaths. Allow this sense of ease and letting go and transitioning to this mode of being simply happen. There have been many opportunities during this gathering where we have been reminded of all of the challenges, the adversities, the social injustices, the racism, the devastating changes in climate, It's a lot to hold. And it's important in moments like these to reflect on what is possible. When Martin Luther King gave his famous speech in the 1960s, it was not, I have a nightmare. So let's spend a few moments reflecting on the real possibility that every human being has the same right 
and the same capacity to be happy and to be free of suffering. And even those humans who have been agents of disaster, recognizing that their actions are products of confusion, of delusion, So let's see if we can genuinely extend our capacity to wish others to be truly free of suffering and free of the delusion and confusion that may play a role in the unfortunate and in many cases horrific choices that some have made. And as our time together winds down, let's see if we can all harness the insights, harness the teachings, we have been privileged to participate in. And make an unswerving commitment to bring this out into the world in whatever way is appropriate and skillful for each of our contexts. So that all beings may truly awaken and be free of suffering. So thank you all, and we look forward to hearing my dear friend and colleague, John. Thank you, Richie. So it is my privilege and pleasure to reintroduce John to you. John is a Buddhist scholar, practitioner, teacher. He serves as distinguished chair in contemplative humanities at the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he is also a professor and chair in the Department of Asian Languages and Culture. John, so good to have you here. Thank you, Al, great to be here. Uh, as always, with some old friends and some new ones, uh, I wanna thank our European participants in particular for hanging in there. I'm not sure I'm the right, you know, uh, medicine for almost midnight, but uh, hopefully uh, still um, you'll enjoy it at some level. It's been really great to make this connection across the Atlantic. And I hope that even when maybe we return to an in-person version of this, we somehow manage to maintain 
that connection. So I'm actually going to do something that has a reason for it, which is I'm going to kind of invoke, you know, the Buddhist world here and the lineage of uh, interpretation I'm going to be uh, following in my talk uh, in a sort of formal like way. And uh, you'll, I'll try to explain why I'm doing that later, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it now. We do the Galpana Jala, Gumbiyunu Dara Murtiye, Namaha Samanta Bandraya, Samanta Sparana Tushen, No Bavo, No Pi Bavo, Sin the Chedo Napi Shashvatahat, Nanichanapi and it just one Madaya Yanamos to Te, Sidin Kuki Kana, Buzagi Dala Timba Mumba Raja, Nakanda, the Dershola Toba, you lodge above an hour to the sun. Oman Jagi Ying and Bodran and Tusan Sangi Kungi no one yeek. And Sun Jogun wants on to Zeba Zami Lami Shala Sova them. So um, what I'd like to begin, I, really the way, the place I'm going to begin is how I first, in a sense, got hooked a little on, an, on the inactive perspective or, and the way it first intrigued me. And I was looking for some pictures and I, maybe Richie has some somewhere on his hard drive of our, the meeting, the first Mind and Life meeting that I went to in 2007. I did find some, but I couldn't get the right picture uh, when I first met Evan, actually, I think that was the first time we met, right? And uh, this was a meeting that was on the universe in a single atom, number of really interesting people there, Anton Zeilinger, for example, Arthur Zions, and of course, uh, uh, Richie was there, I think Roshi was there too, uh, Evan. And uh, at that meeting is really, I think one of the first times that I, I kind of got an activism because part of uh, Evan's talk was about that, about the inactive perspective. Uh, and in one of the ways it really resonated with me, interestingly, is not about what Evan spoke about yesterday, although those are clearly also resonant features between Buddhism and the inactive perspective that came out on the embodied mind. Remember that Evan in particular, when he was talking about the kind of, you know, what you might call the view, this is this term in Sanskrit, drshti or tawa in Tibetan, I'll come back to it uh, shortly, that, uh, there, that there are certain aspects of Buddhist theory that clearly are part of what motivated the development of this perspective. But there's also another aspect of Buddhist theory that I don't think uh, Evan you and your co-authors, you and Francisco and Eleanor Roche, that uh, that they, uh, you guys were probably not thinking about this particular theory, which is what's called the theory of exclusion about concept formation. And in brief, the idea here in the theory of exclusion is, is really quite simple, part of, although uh, the details are complex, but in some ways it's really quite simple. And one way to explain it is that if we take, let me take these items here. I have these three items that we would call a pen. And when our sort of naive uh, interpretation of this, our naive intuition of this is that these three things, there's something about them that's the same such that we can call them a pen. And the way that this works uh, classically in Indian philosophy for the realists is that there's something, there is specifically something of course, if you look at them in detail, right, in their actual particularity, you see that they're quite different. But despite those differences, there is some kind of a core feature or even an essence that they share. And this in the, in the Indian philosophical world would be called a, a samanya or a universal. So a, a common term for this, you know, we could sort of uh, a coin penness as the term for this. All pens exhibit penness all gutta, the traditional example of the gutta, the water jug, they all exhibit water jugness, gattatwa, right? So there's some kind of an entity that is adhering in all of these uh, individuals or particulars. And this is what makes us, what makes it possible for us to call all, the, all of them a pen. And that means, part of what that means, of course, is that when we're conceptualizing in the world on this account, and what we can call the sort of classical account, when we're conceptualizing in the world, we're not you know, in, in a sense, we're just kind of picking out what's already there. It's not actually a constructive act in some sense. It is simply seeing what's present to us and then properly identifying it with the right concepts. So this, of course, relates to that platonic view uh, that we heard from Adam. And indeed, on that view, uh, and, and you would find this in some Indian philosophies, even these particular pens, a particular pen is in some sense a kind of imperfect reflection of the true pen, which is the ideal form of the pen. So in some sense, you might say the universal uh, of a pen, the penness 
is truly the ultimate version of a pen. We might, we might even say the ultimate reality of a pen is that it has this penness. That's where we truly understand its identity. And the particular form is, you know, as Adam was saying, is somehow incomplete or even in some sense epiphenomenal, right? Well, that, partic that view or kind of platonic, generically platonic view, which we also find in Nidian philosophies, uh, the Buddhists heavily critique. And instead, what they say is actually, first of all, that universals don't exist. There is no penness. In fact, there's nothing whatsoever. This is, can be challenging for some. There's nothing whatsoever that is the same about these particulars. All particulars are completely unique. And there is nothing at all that is the same about them. Therefore, if we're going to call this a pen and this a pen and the other one a pen, we're engaged in a constructive act of creating a kind of sameness for them. And the act of creating that sameness doesn't happen, it is not therefore about us just kind of picking out what's real in the world. Instead, it's about us constructing a sameness for a particular reason. And basically, in short, you could say that the reason is that we want the good stuff and we don't want the bad stuff, right? We want to get the affordances and we want to avoid the dangers. So we are engaged in the world as agents in the world. And as agents in the world, we're trying this in the Sanskrit term here is heya upadeya or, or Langdor in Tibetan. We're trying to get what we want, what we think will bring us pleasure or happiness or at least survival, right? And we're trying to avoid the things that are give, going to bring us pain or even put an end to our lives. So that basic motivation then, in, through, with that basic motivation, we engage in the world and construct categories. Now, I'm not going to talk about the details of how that conceptual construction occurs. It, that's where some of the complexities come in. It, it, the theory in Sanskrit is called apoha, uh, the, the theory of exclusion. And basically, the idea here, uh, one key feature of it we should, we should keep in mind is that according to the theory of exclusion, we make sameness through difference. Right? So even though there's nothing the same about all of these things such that we can call them a pen, and I mean that literally, like nothing whatsoever, nevertheless, we can differentiate them in terms of things that we want to do. So when we think about causal efficacy in the world, we can construct a category for these things. If we want to write, or even our concept of writing, of course, is once again a case of a construction. But if we want to engage in a particular kind of activity, we can, through the difference that these things have in regard to other things, we can construct this sameness. So that's a, a very, a very short and simple account of this idea of uh, the theory of exclusion that is concept formation. And I think probably already you can see some ways in which this overlaps within an active perspective fairly straightforwardly. I'm going to come back to that. But first, I want to talk about a few sequelae, if you like, a few things that kind of follow from this view. So the first of these that's really quite important is that our naive intuition is indeed that there's something the same about all pens, about all things we call people, about all water jugs or guttas, whatever it is, and that that is something that is built into the system. It, it be, and the reason it has to be built into the system is it could not be learned through experience. In other words, since these things are actually different, if we're going to conceptualize them as the same, that sameness can't be learned by saying, oh, those two things really are the same, because they're not. So this has to be innate to the system. It has to be built into the system. And that innate tendency to, in a sense, put things together into categories is actually, on, the, on this account, is a form of ignorance. And the author who's best known for constructing this theory is, uh, is, goes by the name of Dharmakirti, one of my favorites that many of you know, an uh, author in the seventh century, Buddhist scholar uh, of India who uh, wrote in Sanskrit. And for Dharmakirti, Dharmakirti even says actually, Vikalpa Evahi Avidya, ignorance, it's, excuse me, conceptuality itself is ignorance. So the seeing of categories in the world is precisely this, it's a distortion. There are no categories like that. There is no sameness. Everything, the only things that are real that are, are things that we can actually touch 
taste, smell, see, hear, particulars, things that we actually come into contact with. And we make those categories because we're trying to survive. We're trying to survive in what the Buddhists would call samsara, right? The, 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 uh, the world of suffering, the cyclic, the merry-go-round of suffering, as it were. So we are constructing these categories through an innate tendency to make categories, which is a kind of distortion. So if therefore one sequelae for this position is that all explanatory, all concepts are distorted. They are distorted because they're creating a false sameness. There are other distortions as well, but we'll focus on that one. And moreover, they are also always incomplete because the only way that we can make these things the same is if we ignore their differences between each other and focus on the way they're different than everything else. Like I can do things with these that I can't do with this. So I ignore the way they're different from each other and I focus on the way they're different from that. And that's a, a very brief way of talking about how that construction occurs. But that means I have to ignore their differences. I have to not see them in their particularity. I have to stop seeing the particularity in order to make those constructions in the world that enable, to get, enable me to get what I want and avoid what I don't want. So one sequela here again is that there's always a distortion built into the conceptual process and, and that this conceptual process is always incomplete. It never fully describes anything. So in that sense, not just concepts, but therefore also explanatory systems themselves are always distortions and incomplete. It is not possible to have an undistorted and complete account of whatever. Uh, so, you know, the fantasy of the God's eye view that's the, that uh, Adam was talking about and that uh, Marcelo, Adam and Evan are working on in their book, right? Uh, the blind spot, that's of course heavily critiqued here, that, that way of you know, it's conceptualizing knowledge. Now, an additional point here is that explanatory systems, if we're going to create an explanatory system, we're always doing this for a purpose. We don't deploy concepts for no reason. We do it because, again, we're trying to get something or avoid something. So all, another sequelae here is that all, uh, all concepts are in some sense teleological. It's always about a, a goals, goal orientation. Even higher order concepts, according to Dharmakirti, have a kind of teleological basis. And key thing for Dharmakirti and really all of the subsequent philosophers who follow him is that when you deploy a Buddhist explanatory system, if that Buddhist explanatory system is meant to, so to speak, climb up the ladder that, that Evan was talking about yesterday, from Abhidharma to Madhyamaka, from a view of no self to a view of emptiness, then that explanatory system has to undo itself. It has to self-consciously be a system that is always undoing itself. At the first level where this view is presented, uh, it doesn't kind of, in a sense, undo itself completely. It only undoes itself to the extent that it says this system is a system that is distorted and incomplete. At the highest level of analysis, the system is uh, the, the view, in a sense, of the highest level of analysis is that there is no view. So that's why when we get all the way up to Madhyamaka, Nagarjuna famously says that to hit the philosophy of emptiness is sarvadrushti prahanam the abandonment of all views, right? If you have a view as your ultimate view, you're not playing this Buddhist game anyway. You may be playing some other game, but you're not playing this Buddhist game if you have a view that's your ultimate view. This all means, of course, that there's no disinterested explanations. We can't just sort of sit back and describe the world. We can't have an explanatory system and then sit back and describe the world, which is just kind of presented to us uh, as objects with objective identities, all explanatory systems have an agenda. And the agenda, in a sense, you could say at some level actually is not all that different from what Adam was talking about, even for the most basic organism, prediction and control. That we want to predict what's going to happen next so that we can get the good stuff and avoid the bad stuff. And we want to be able to control uh, the world enough so that we can actually reach it, so to speak, right? We identify it and then we need to act. Uh, 
And a key, another key sequela here is that all action in the world, agency in the world, has to be driven by concepts. So on the one hand, concepts are distorting. Uh, they are incomplete. But without them, we can't do anything. So in order for us to engage as ordinary beings in the world, us humans, to engage in the world, we, we must use concepts. And yet, they are always going to have an agenda. They're always uh, uh, um, there. You could say there's always an axiology, a set of values that are behind them. Now, when within that sort of axiology, right, our agenda, or our axiology, our, our vision of, of what is valuable, we then, when we deploy concepts or explanations from an explanatory standpoint, we are always doing that, you could say, about because we care about something. And I want to, here, I really want to see you point out that in, I think, a very interesting way that I think has been intentional when I heard Ezekiel, uh, whose talk I loved, by the way, uh, uh, talk about this, is that the word care actually has a kind of, is, there's a nice little, what in Sanskrit would be called a shlesha, a kind of double meaning, a double entendre that we can find here in the term care. So one of them is to just pay attention, to think of something as important. So that's the use of the term care I'm using right now. I, uh, we, we deploy concepts because there's something that is valuable to us that we care about in that sense. And we may care about things that don't show a lot of care in a second sense to sentient beings, right? So we may care, for example, about control. Uh, we may care about uh, wealth and power. And because we care about that, perhaps we're willing to do quite a lot of harm to others. So caring in one sense does not at all guarantee that we care in some other sense, right? In that second sense of showing kindness, of being concerned for the welfare of others. And you can say in particular that we talk about care, this is an intuition you find, especially in the non-dual Buddhist traditions, but not so fully articulated, but you can certainly find it in contemporary moral psychology. And also to some extent, like Sean Nichols work on, on personal identity, that uh, one of the ways we can talk about what we care about is in terms of ethics and morality. That these are especially that the, our sense of what is moral is especially powerful when we're deploying our explanatory systems, when we're deploying our concepts, the sense of what is moral, what is right and what is wrong, and the emotions that come with it, like moral outrage, that those are, are especially, in a sense, powerful in terms of driving our explanations, driving our concepts. And if we can think of ourselves as Dharmakirti, so uh, the one of the verses I recited at the beginning is actually from Dharmakirti, and it starts by saying, Vidu, Viduta Kalpana Jala, those who have destroyed the web of concepts. The idea here is that we are caught in the web of concepts. And one of the things that catches us the most deeply is our sense of what is moral and emotions like moral outrage. Another sequela here is that, and a very important one, and I'd be very intrigued, I'm going to have a series of questions for my, uh, for the, uh, I won't call you an activist, because that would make you followers of an activism. I'd rather be part of the Church of Evan and follow Thompsonism. But uh, he hasn't. He's refused to start it. So uh, you know, uh, is that? Uh, and I, anyway, seriously, though, curious to see, see what you think of this idea. You can't care about everything because if you care, if everything is important, you can't make meaning anymore, right? As, especially on this account, if everything is equally important, then the difference required to make meaning is no longer available. So within an explanatory system, within our use of concepts, we literally can't care about everything because if we care about everything, then every, we can't say nothing has meaning anymore. It's a little bit like, you know, the aberrant salience we would see as a feature of some versions of, of, psycho, of psychosis quite frequently, where suddenly, you know, everything is equally tremendously, look at the pen, it's so meaningful. Or, you know, uh, we also see this uh, with psychedelics, like, oh, look at that. Everything is sort of, you know, I care about everything. And then in some sense, I don't care about anything anymore, right? Because all my, I have no values. 
uh, because everything is valuable. So with these sequelae, I think there are some very important questions that emerge also for the Buddhists, and I think maybe also for an activism. And the way I would frame this is actually in terms of the ethics of knowledge, right? That Evan was talking about yesterday. Thank you for a great talk, Evan. That there is, because our explanatory system al always has an agenda, if you like, always is driven by some kind of a purpose, always has some kind of an axiology, some version of what is valuable, and probably uh, on this account, at least unconsciously, some kind of a, a moral framework. That means that the way in which we construct our systems, and we are constructing them because they're not given objectively by identities in the world, is really going to have to do with what we think is moral, what we think is valuable. So when we look at Dharmakirti system, the purpose of this system, and there's a lot more to it, there's a lot of stuff about perception, about how uh, inference works, right? The, the basic point of Dharmakirti's system is to describe how suffering sentient beings operate in the world. So the, that whole account I'm talking about basically is caught up in suffering. Right? You could say it's caught up in prediction and control. And the way in, so it's not just, so first of all, it is a description, but it's a, it's a description with a purpose. And the purpose is to show one the way out of that state, right? What are the errors? How can we scaffold individuals out of a state in which they are caught up in getting the good stuff and avoiding the bad stuff for themselves? It's also therefore embedded in, and this is really key. So we're going to show the errors in the, in like, I think I've got the view of the world. You know, my philosophy is right. My moral framework is the, is the one true framework. I, I, I am creating all kinds of suffering for myself and others. Uh, this, this explanatory system comes along and says, no, you know, you're actually constructing this world. You're, you're in mutual construction. Your sense of who you are and that world are mutually constructing each other or, or in a process of mutual construction. And there are certain errors we can identify in that, which helps you to recognize that that's the fact. And you can transform yourself. So part of what's key here is this is also embedded in, in what in theology is called an anthropology meaning an account of the human. What kind of a person am I? What kind of a person are humans? And for that matter, other, other creatures, other sentient beings. What kind of a, but let's focus on humans. What kind of a creature is a human such that this sentient being, this human can transform themselves out of that state? So this description is not a description that says, you know, this is how human conceptual systems function. And, you know, we're all screwed, so to speak. It's, uh, we're just stuck in this, in this deluded reality where we see essences where there are no essences, where we cling to our views and our morality and, uh, you know, just come into conflict. So the idea here is that, that, that there's an anthropology, uh, meaning an account of what it means to be human that goes with the explanatory system. And I would argue that this is true of all explanatory systems that are focusing on how humans do things, or, or really probably any organism, any sentient being, that there's an implicit anthropology about what is and is not possible, especially in terms of transformation. Now, there's an, there's an additional kind of agenda in this view, which is that this view is designed to, is, is, is built within a system that's explicitly about scaffolding one's level of understanding, one's level of transformation and behavior change to prepare for an even deeper account. So at this level, and these are different levels of analysis uh, that uh, occur in this style of Buddhist philosophy, and this level uh, of account, there's a world, there's a sentient being, the sentient being is engaging in the world, the sense of there being a kind of duality there, there are certain distortions in it, but basically you can say, yeah, there's a world and there are sentient beings. At the next level, that duality itself is called into question. That duality, the sense of this world out there and sentient being here, itself it seemed to be at a deeper level, a source of suffering, the deepest source of suffering. 
And since all conceptualizations are rooted in that agent acting in the world, that means that all conceptualizations are caught up in that false duality. And therefore, any conceptualization, i.e. any view that you have, has to be abandoned because it's always going to be distorted and false. You may have it for, it can be convenient to have certain explanations that one deploys, you might even say ironically, so as to make sense of things and to make one's way in the world, and also specifically so as to transform oneself, beliefs that are entertained for a while until one moves to another level of belief. But at the, in the end, any sense of there being an ultimate reality, uh, an, a world that exists in some ultimate sense that one can engage with is just incoherent. So on this score, I would have to say to Adam, actually, I don't think there is a world without us on this point of view. That does not mean that the world is our mind. It just means that world also is a concept. It's a model, the notion of world in, in opposition to self. Now, when we talk about the source of this suffering, right? We talked about one version of this is in a sense being caught up in the game of getting and avoiding things, of being an individual, that's one level, of being a samsaric survivor, a survivor in the world of suffering, making one's way, at least not dying, and maybe actually getting some pleasure now and then. Uh, that's one level. The next level is just the idea of there being self and world, that distinction, that duality. So these are kind of the sources of suffering. And as we are going to be moving, and now the claim is that these conceptual systems, which are designed to describe in a particular way, the way in which uh, the cognitive system works, and here I would include emotion, meant to describe that in a way in which one can then recognize errors and transform oneself, that again, it assumes a kind of anthropology and axiology. And I just want to say a couple of things about that before I end by uh, asking some questions about inactivism. So the first thing I want to say is that, you know, sometimes we talk about what it means to be a Buddha and like, what are Buddhas like? And do they have that bump on the top of the head or not really, you know, do they really have webs between their fingers and all that kind of stuff. So the image, it's very important to recognize that most people are not Buddhas. Uh, you know, Al, I think, is. But, you know, the rest of us, he certainly looks like Buddha. But the rest of us, you know, we're not Buddhas, right? So uh, we, so it's not the, the and even the idea that we're going to somehow become a Buddha in this lifetime, that's a rhetoric you find in Tibetan Buddhism in particular. But still, the, the actual cultural expression of that is, oh, no. In fact, in the Tibetan world, pretty much a guaranteed way to say to uh, be ostracized by the community is to claim that you're a Buddha. Then they'll say, well, that means you're definitely not, right? Unlike America, but that's another thing. So the role of this image of being a Buddha, right, where we're headed, our final endpoint of our transformation, almost stands as a kind of paradigm that guides our transformation, guides this conceptual systems that we're deploying to get to that state. Uh, but it is not a, it's not a reality that we are uh, uh, living through. I think that's so important to see the way in which there can be a kind of goal that's almost like an unobtainable goal, or certainly a very distal goal, a very very far, far away, and that that somehow guides our practice in the present. And what comes along with that is also at the same time, a vision not just of the Buddha, but precisely because Buddhas are not obtaining uh, that endpoint for themselves. I'll come back to that soon. Again, Buddhas are not obtaining the endpoint for themselves. Therefore, it also has to be about a world right? A, a paradise, if you like. And that paradise, there are many different, uh, there are many different uh, uh, forms of this paradise. Here's just one quick one. This is the, what's called Chakbori, uh, the copper colored mountain. This is the pure land of the central figure here is Padmasambhava, uh, who's connected to the tradition that I was evoking, uh, invoking earlier. Right? And so there are various visions of what paradise looks like. You know, this might not look like your version of paradise. Uh, Maybe your version of paradise looks more like, you know, a beach on the Bahamas or something, whatever it is, 
But the point is that both the person, the kind of being one becomes and the kind of world one lives in, that this forms an axiology, it forms a series of values, it includes an ethics that enables one to not actually necessarily realize in that in one's lifetime. And in fact, the expectation is that one will not realize it in one's lifetime, but rather that guides a kind of vision of personal and uh, communal transformation. So that axiology is incredibly important. And it really has kind of two expressions. You might say there's a range of expressions. Very interestingly, the uh, Indian Buddhism in particular and Indian culture in particular, uh, there's a certain fondness for just kind of, you know, stopping, just cessation. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, just like blow out the candle, stop, it's all over, kaput, you know, khatam, all done, sefini, you know, uh, that sense of absolute termination, which, you know, I'm a department chair right now, and sometimes I, it sounds pretty appealing, but uh, uh, it is, uh, that is very powerful. And that is one version of Buddhahood, which is Buddhahood, in, in Buddhahood, so the way the philosopher, the seventh century philosopher Chandrakirti describes this, and this became a very commonly used metaphor, is that, uh, you know, if you go up to the wish granting tree, uh, the mythical wish granting tree, and you say, I don't know, uh, I, want a, uh, I want a Ferrari, I don't really want a Ferrari, but that just what came to mind, uh, the tree doesn't think, oh, I think has, you know, has John been a good guy? Does he deserve a Ferrari? It just gives you a Ferrari because that's what it does. It's like me almost mechanistic. So some accounts, the Indian accounts of Buddhahood, actually, uh, some of them, many of them actually focused on this idea of the, the Buddha is kind of not there anymore. No internal life, you know, not making decisions because if the Buddha is making decisions, then he's using concepts he or she, and if she's using concepts, then she's caught up in this dualistic world and she's confused and ignorant. So the Buddha just becomes like a sort of empathy machine whose only goal is to just transform other beings and their world and is not trying to create their own version of the world. The world is just kind of being created through them. Now that turns out to be, you know, not very appealing. I think for Westerners, that's not a very appealing view of what it means to be a Buddha and the Tibetans certainly didn't like it. So another alternative version of this is really you could say that the Buddha becomes a sort of world maker, a world builder, and that the goal of uh, uh, practice is to no longer be, in a sense, producing a world for yourself. You're no longer making a world for yourself. Instead, you're making a world for others. And one way to conceptualize this is that the engine that drives samsara, the world of suffering, is ignorance, specifically kind of defined behaviorally as fixation on getting what I want and avoiding what I don't want. Fixation on my view, fixation on having my perspective. And the abandonment of that, the transformation that occurs is a transformation in which one no longer has one's own view. One has the view of sentient beings in, which, in a skillful way in which one is trying to bring them out of their fixation on view. One no longer has one's own view of, one's own version, one's own axiology of what beauty is, of what paradise looks like. One instead is, in a sense, working with sentient beings to, uh, to realize that for them. So that I'm the engine of the world of suffering, again, is like, in a sense, you know, the organism trying to make its way. And here, the, it's no longer about that individual organism. It's about everybody else. Okay. So with that in mind, let me then, uh, you could say, in a sense, the agency moves from a self-focused agency to an other-focused agency. And in these last few minutes, I just want to show a few slides here, if I could. Uh, see if I can get this together. I, uh, Ezekiel very kindly lent me his slides. 
And, you know, this is just kind of done in the spirit, uh, somewhat playful spirit of responding. Oh, I don't have advanced version in this. Oh, okay. oh yes, I do. There we go. All right. One second. Okay, can you see that all right? All right, so uh, this is that great slide. Uh, uh, you make beautiful slides, Ezekiel. Uh, and this is this wonderful slide. It had animations before. So where that sort of paradigm of autopoiesis involves this tension between self-distinction and self-production. And you could say that the early Buddhist version of how to, this is in a sense from a, from a Buddhist standpoint, this could be described as in a way, this is basically samsara, right? So this is the individual organism trying to get it the good stuff and, the bad, and avoid the bad stuff. And that does it through, the, through its agency. Uh, and uh, it is in a sense, really it, caught in its own act of self-distinction. So, the, so that the, the core problem here from the, earth, from the Buddhist standpoint at the first level of analysis where selflessness or no self applies is the urge for self-distinction. In the 12 links of dependent origination, this is called bhava, the sort of thirst to exist. And so that thirst to exist is what drives, is driving this, the engine here, right? It's the engine that's driving this process. And agency is the way that's expressed, right, behaviorally. But uh, the core is this urge to be to, for self-distinction, the urge in a sense to be, to be an individual. And that urge then uh, for early Buddhism, one solution in a sense, right? The solution that comes just out of selflessness is uh, just to stop being an agent. And this was not just in Buddhism, you find this also in Jainism, where one of, in some versions of Jainism, you know, one of the highest practices was literally to starve to death, right? Just, you just stop doing. And when that stops, then you get this version of Nirvana, which is, well, that, it's like, it's just niroda. It's just pure cessation. But the later, later forms of Buddhism, the ones in which we talk about the paradigm of Buddhahood as the goal, right? Where one is seeking not to just put an end to things, but rather to, in a sense, rebuild the world, to re remove the engine that is the self-focused fixation, and instead, to use compassion as the new engine, right? Compassion, complete other focus, radical other focus, a kind of other focus uh, that makes, for example, the notion of self-compassion uh, not really um, sensible from a Mahayana Buddhist standpoint, as has been pointed out by Bhikkhu Analyo and Bhikkhuni Dhammadina in a recent article. And I also wrote an article on that, happy to share. So the question then is, well, what's this new paradigm? And now I'm gonna, you're gonna see my really terrible uh, attempt at trying to make sense of it with, <laughs> with uh, uh, this diagram, right? So it's not, so I'm gonna, so the, so the paradigm, right? But what is trying to train oneself to be, and this is the practice of the Bodhisattva, is there is agency, but the agency is no longer about the self. It's no longer about making sense of the world to get affordances and to avoid dangers. It's about the whole world, actually. It's about everyone else, right? It's actually specifically not about self, it's about other. And it's about working with that entire community to, in a sense, remake the world into a vision of, and this is something that Abiba also pointed out, we need visions, but we also need practical visions, right? We need steps that we can take, not just some strange sci-fi version. So this, I think, in a sense, is something like a reimagining in the bodhisattva practice of, the, uh, uh, of an inactive perspective. But I admit, it's hardly worked through. It's just something that came to me over the last couple of days, and it could certainly be much improved on. So this just brings me then to some questions uh, for an action. Uh, one of them is, what is the purpose of this explanatory system? Is it more than descriptive? It seems like it is more than descriptive, but I just wonder how, in what way. Uh, is there an inactive anthropology? And I don't mean anthropology as a discipline. I mean, it's specifically in that theological sense as the account of a human, like what's possible. For example, 
Can, are we just stuck in this process, in this system? Uh, is there no other way to be? To be? Or, or, or is, in a sense, an, an, an inactive account of cognition just the way it's always going to be for us? Uh, what is the vision of the world we would make through an inactive point of view? And what are the distortions in the inactive perspective? Does it undo itself? In what ways all systems are incomplete, biased? What are the biases in, in the inactive perspective? Does it deliberately undo itself? I think the answer to that might depend on who you talk to. But I, I might believe my time is up if I'm, if I'm right. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. Thank you very much. John, thank you so much. Wonderful. So I'd like to uh, invite Gabor to comment. Thank you, Roshi. Um, I was listening uh, for the two days with, uh, with uh, deep appreciation to all the uh, speeches and all the, all the perspectives that we, we, we heard about. And I would just simply follow up on what uh, John has said. Uh, if the inactive approach as uh, so a description of what is, is true, meaning that it's universal, we may come to a strange conclusion. And the strange conclusion is that uh, enactment or, or bringing forth is not ethical per se, because everything happening, if the inactive approach is true, everything happening is a form of uh, enactment, a co-emergence of actor, act, and the word acted upon, which means that war school shooting, racism, all are an action too. They are participatory. Uh, they make sense in a very strange, weird way to the ones enacting them. An absurd, weird form of participatory sense-making takes place. So how to imbue the basic functionings of an action with ethics? Not only with the ethics of knowledge probably, but the ethics of living together. What is the ethics that we understand in the context of the embodied mind? in the context of the ethical dimension of groundlessness. And I was so happy to hear Adam, Adam Frank, referring to Whitehead, one of my uh, personal heroes as a philosopher. And I would just like to quote uh, one phrase or one sentence from his uh, book, uh, Process and Reality. He says, the revolts of destructive evil, purely self-regarding, are dismissed into, into their triviality of merely, merely individual facts. And yet, the good they did achieve in individual joy, in individual sorrow, in the introduction of needed contrast, is yet saved by its relation to the completed whole. I'm going to put this quote in the, in the chat. So my overall question to not only John, but to, to all and to myself would be, what is this ethical dimension of groundlessness in the midst of all those crises that we were hearing about war, racism, social justice, or social injustice, and the climate change. Mm. I don't know the answer. Thank you so much for that um, uh, really uh, difficult question that you've actually posed to John from the point of view of Dharmakirti, because Dharmakirti posits that um, 
causal relations, like all relations, are not in themselves real entities, and yet they're suffering. So, I, John, I'd be interested to uh, hear your perspective on Gabor's question. I Gabor's question had so many levels to it, I, I'm not <laughs> even sure where to start. But let me just reread this beautiful, the revolts of destructive evil purely self-regarding are dismissed into their triviality of merely individual facts. And yet the good they did achieve an individual joy and individual sorrow in the introduction of needed contrast is yet saved by its relation to the completed whole. Who was that again, Gabor? That was Whitehead. White, Whitehead. That was Whitehead. <laughs> Sounds like Whitehead. <laughs> My head always spins. <laughs> uh, the um, groundlessness, I think is in a certain way, the key feature of the ethics of knowledge of this style of Buddhism, which is to say that what groundless, so groundlessness does not mean nothing. It means, and this is like, if we think of this style of Buddhism as its pinnacle is basically Majamaka thought, which uh, Evan referred to yesterday and I briefly referred to. And as, uh, as you know, uh, you know, the final account is emptiness. Uh, if we say what is ultimate, what, is, what are things ultimately, the answer is emptiness. But that does not mean that emptiness itself is ultimate. It's in a way of saying that was a silly question, what's the ultimate? All that's left, as Nagarjuna says, you know, Yaha Praticha Samut Param Shunya Tam Tam Prachakshmahe. We say that. When we say emptiness, what we mean is interdependence. So to be groundless is to be inevitably connected in all ways, including in one's knowledge, that to know is always to know with others. It's impossible to know on one's own, not just with the world, not just world making. And I guess one of my implicit kind of concerns sometimes about an activism is it sounds like the unit of analysis is this kind of individual thing that, you know, and well, we're the metaphor of autopoiesis is like, you know, it's this bounded thing, even though I know, and I'm sure uh, Ezekiel and Hannah will correct me, but even though I know in some sense, of course, it's permeable, it's not just, an, it's a system made of systems, but still there's a sense in which we can sometimes feel like there is a ground, which is, you know, the, the, the organism in relation to the world. And so that ground, the groundlessness here is there's, that individual is only an individual in relation. Knowledge only happens in relation, which also means that there's no perspective that is the final perspective. And that itself, I think, is an ethical standpoint, which means that we are, you know, like it or not, making the world together. So that embrace, I think, that's the challenge. You know, Richie spoke about the 85%. The challenge is to, in a sense, you know, this is some kind of phase of evolution, even culturally at least, to be able to embrace that notion. And that's tremendously difficult because, you know, humans have not, have not evolved in that way so far, it seems. Humans and human cultures where we can, in a sense, where we don't fixate on my view, my morality, my beauty, whatever it is. I don't mean to be so pessimistic. Thank you, John. Um, I, Evan, I, I see, see you working out something. I'm always working out something. I know you are. With but varying I just, degrees of success or lack thereof. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm curious what you're turning with right now. Yeah. Well, I was. I mean, it was a wonderful talk, John. That was that was really um, yeah. That was really splendid. fantastic. Um, I was thinking about the questions that you know John had posed mm -hmm. um, at the very end. The questions for an action, and. Um, you know, his last question was, does it undo itself? And this reminded me of something that, uh, that Francisco said, actually, in a talk that he gave about his experience of the Civil War in Chile 
and his having to, you know, flee. And this, this was the talk I heard him give, you know, when I was a very young teenager at Lindisfarne. But at, at one point, I think actually towards the end of the talk, he basically says, if, if this is, so this is at a Lindisfarne Fellows meeting, he says, if this isn't at a gathering where we're going to work towards a kind of, I'm, I'm not using his exact words, but this is the thought, you know, work towards a kind of knowledge or really a kind of wisdom that consists in knowing how to undo itself, then I'm not interested. I'd rather go skiing, which is a <laughs> kind of typical Francisco expression. Um, but it was his way of saying that, and he hadn't at this point arrived at the term in action. So this was, you know, this is in the mid 1970s. He's still very much kind of working within the, um, you know, phase of his work that had to do with autopoiesis and, um, and self-reference and things like that. Um, but this, this idea, I think, carried over very much into how we thought about an action as we were writing The Embodied Mind, that it's a perspective that strives to have, and in this sense, it's also not merely descriptive, it's more than descriptive, because it strives to have a kind of, you could call it a kind of critical reflexivity that is attuned to the acts that bring itself into being in such a way that those can be dropped, that, that they can be let go of, or that they can be yeah. used without fixity. That's, that's an aspiration, you could say. It's not to say that it's accomplished, but it's a, it's a kind of guiding aspiration of the inactive approach, at least as, as we were thinking about it. And that was one reason why Madhyamaka was significant for us philosophically is because we saw that idea expressed in, in Madhyamaka. That doesn't answer the other part of your question, what are the distortions in the inactive perspective? And I think that's actually a very interesting question that I want to think more about. Um, it would be naive to think there aren't distortions. And I agree with you that in a sense, any conceptual system, any map, any categorical scheme is, you might say, inherently distortive just by virtue of being a conceptual system. It has to be selective. It has to accentuate certain things rather than others. But at the same time, and I think this is something you said, um, it, it would be it would be a wrong move to try to, no, I, I don't want to put it that way. You could try to drop it entirely. That, that's the exit strategy. So you could try to make that choice. But it would be naive to think that the way to make it less distortive is to try to, you know, be increasingly faithful in some sense, because then you get, you know, the Borges story where the emperor asked for a map of the kingdom and eventually what he gets is a duplication of the kingdom, which is just a duplication of how the kingdom is experienced from that biased perspective anyway. So it just renders the distortions in ever more detail, you might say. So I think that's actually a very important question. What are the distortions? Or maybe the way that I would put it is, how do we try to be mindful or keep track of the distortions that are inevitably going to come into play? And I would see that as part of how the aspiration is not to be merely descriptive, but to be critically reflexive. And again, that signals for me something distinctive about the inactive approach, different from, from certainly in the cognitive science context, where we're, we're studying the mind, different from other kinds of scientific um, approaches. With the, what is an active anthropology? I think that's an interesting, interesting way of putting the question there. I actually think there is some very rich work that's, that's done particularly by Ezekiel and Hannah. I mean, I think the book Linguistic Bodies is actually very much about an active anthropology focused specifically on building up to an account of language in a participatory sense-making frame. So that's where I would look for, I mean, they can speak more about that. I don't wanna speak for them, but, but that's where I would look for, for, for ideas about what you're calling you know, anthropology in that, in that particular sense. Thank you, Ab. I, I want uh, I want us out of uh, Gabor's wonderful uh, question and also John's questions uh, and your reflection. I, I'd like us to just hold that for uh, some minutes. We need to take a break. It's been very, very dense from uh, more than an hour. So I'm going to invite us to uh, 
take a, a five minute stretch break, if, if you will. We'll come back at 11 after the hour. Uh, this is just a quick stretch break. And then we'll go back into some of those questions that you were asking, John. I I'd also like us to uh, um, ask you, Gabor, to reflect on you know, what you heard from John and be very helpful also to hear from Hannah and Ezekiel. And then we, we can go from the mind to the cosmos with uh, Richie and Adam. So we'll, we'll come back 11 after the hour. <laughs> 